Hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's good to be with you on this Wednesday, July 27th, and here's some of what we're talking about tonight. Interest rates are going up again, this time by a lot more than usual. Will it be enough to fend off a recession? We'll have analysis of this latest increase next. The economy is already tough enough, including with rents going up. One big reason for that? Private equity firms are driving up costs. You'll see how in tonight's feature report. Plus, a prisoner swap with Russia could set two Americans free, including WNBA star Brittany Griner. The U.S. is preparing an offer. Who might Russia get in return? And will Vladimir Putin accept? And these summer heat waves may be the new normal. We'll show you how governments are working to keep people safe, including a new website, heat.gov. So those monthly payments on your credit card and your car and maybe your house, they include interest. That is, unless you pay each month in full. Interest is how lenders make money, and now you might find yourself paying more interest again. Today, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates by three quarters of a percent. That's the second hike in two months, the fourth one this year, and the biggest in decades. This increase means that mortgages, credit card debts, loans, and more could get more expensive this month. And today, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell said this might not be the last time. From the standpoint of our congressional mandate to promote maximum employment and price stability, the current picture is plain to see. The labor market is extremely tight and inflation is much too high. Against this backdrop, today the FOMC raised its policy interest rate by three quarters of a percentage point and anticipates that ongoing increases in the target range for the federal funds rate will be appropriate. Inflation in the U.S. is at an all-time high. It has been for months now, and we're feeling it just about everywhere we spend money, gas and groceries and basic necessities and more. Now, these rate hikes are meant to bring down those costs in the long run. But how long will that take? Let's get into that with Caleb Silver, Editor-in-Chief of Investopedia. Mr. Silver, welcome back. Good to see you again. Good to be with you. Do we have to do this again? We have to do, do it again. Do we have to do this again? Another interest rate hike? Like, haven't we hiked interest rates enough? Not yet, and there's going to be another one after the next one in September. So expect a couple more hikes. The Fed funds rate, that's what we call it. That's at around 2.25, 2.50% right now. That's going to go to 3.4%. So expect another round of rate hikes at the next Fed meeting in September. This is what has to be done to bring those prices down. The concern, obviously, you put the economy into a deep freeze and a potential recession. How does that work? How do raising interest rates bring down inflation and bring down costs? They destroy demand because when rates rise, it costs more to borrow things. You laid it out cleanly in the open here. Your credit card APR rises. The 30-year the fixed rate for a mortgage rises. Car payments rise uh, if you're buying a new car. So you back away as consumers from those high rates because you don't want to pay those interest costs. You don't want to pay those monthly payments. That that destroys demand, and it's already happening in the U.S. housing market. It's happening in the new vehicle market. It's, hard, it's starting to work. We're just not even close to where we need to be yet. So it's a behavioral tool. It's basically a way of making consumers look at the cost of doing something and going to hell with it. I'm not going to do this right now. That's right. Consumers and businesses, because businesses borrow a lot of money, too, especially tech companies, especially growth companies. They borrow a lot of money to finance their costs, to make acquisitions, to acquire other companies or build their businesses a little bit bigger. So they back off from borrowing as well. That brings everything down a little bit and potentially puts the economy into a deep freeze. Let's break down some of what we heard from the Fed. Part of the Fed statement, in part, it reads, quote, recent indicators of spending and production have softened. What does that mean? That means retail sales are slowing, not, not going uh, negative yet, but retails have been slowing month after month. Business inventories, business purchases are slowing too. These are some of the things the Fed looks at when it's deciding what to do with monetary policy. Ultimately, the Fed cares about two things. Price stability, that's inflation, not under control, and a robust job market, full employment, that's really between 3 and 4% unemployment. Check on that, no check on the other. Chairman Powell also responded to concerns about a recession today. Here is part of what he said. Watch. I do not think the U.S. is currently in a recession. Um, and the reason is there are just too many areas of the economy that are, that are performing, uh, you know, 
too well. And, and of course, I would point to the labor market in, in particular. 2.7 million people hired in the first half of the year. Uh, it doesn't make sense that the economy would be in recession with, with this kind of thing happening. What about that? What do you make of his comments that we're not in a recession? Well, the thing about a recession is you don't know you're in one until you're already through one, because we have to look back and see if we've had a couple of quarters of negative growth, if we've seen a real slowdown in business spending and consumer spending and in the labor market. So you don't know until it's kind of already, you're already through it. But he's got a pretty good eye on things and a pretty good eye on the data. He points to the labor market. We're averaging about 350,000 jobs added every month for the past 12 months. We've never seen a streak that strong. But don't forget where we came from. There were massive layoffs in the spring of 2020 when the COVID pandemic began. So the hiring back was aggressive. Will the pace continue? We're already starting to see layoffs in the retail sector and among technology companies. I could use a little help understanding what we're supposed to think about being in a recession. I'm starting to feel like... This whole thing about a recession, are you in one? Maybe you're in one. How do you define it? We don't know. It almost feels like being drunk. You don't necessarily know you're drunk until you're too far gone. And then some drunks are fun and some drunks end up in jail. Like you don't know what they're gonna do until something happens. And I feel like just the talk of the recession is agita inducing. And I'm like, tell me when it's happened and tell me what we're supposed to do about it. How should we be thinking about this prospect of a recession in terms of whether it'll be real bad, whether it'll be okay, serious, not so serious? How are we thinking about this? Well, it really depends on where you are. And personal finance is personal. So some folks feel like they've been in a recession since the spring of 2020, never got out of it. Talk to some restaurant owners. Right. It's been bad since COVID. Right. On the other hand, if your uh, household income is above $150,000, usually you have a little more discretionary income and you can spend on the things you want. You can spend on travel, maybe make that new car purchase. So the more money you make, the less you feel it in some cases, but lower income folks feel like they never got out of one. Maybe they feel like they're in a, in a permanent state of recession, but really we have to look at the economy overall. And if we get that real slowdown in consumer spending, which drives 70% of our GDP, we're going to really feel a recession because you're going to see layoffs, you're going to see business closures, you're going to see a lot of bankruptcies, and you're going to see consumer debt rising. Well, it also feels like the circumstances this time, there's so many other factors between the war in Ukraine the continuing push of automation, COVID driving people out of offices and then back into offices, supply chain issues. It almost feels like I don't want to think too much about recession because there's so many other things that are going to bear on the economy, too. Yeah, there are so many things happening. It's the perfect storm of a lot of those events coming together. But when you want to look at the bigger picture, you want to say, is the economy growing? Can I go out and improve myself? Can I improve my job? Can I buy that thing that I wanted to buy if I wanted to get that first home? A lot of those things are out of reach for a lot of people. And as these interest rates rise, it's going to make them even further out of reach for those first time home buyers, for those lower income families that are just trying to get a leg up that maybe lost a step in the last couple of years that's where the recession feels very personal to people so we could call it what we want the white house tried to redefine it over the weekend a recession really is this giant slowdown in growth overall and a lot of people are feeling it we may not be in a technical one but for folks on the ground especially the lower income folks they've been in one for a long time i know i gotta let you go in just a second but with regard to all of these other factors for people who are struggling is this prospect of a recession, what they should be paying attention to, or should we be paying more attention to the job markets or the war in Ukraine or, you know, getting back to offices over COVID? Like if I'm an everyday person who's just trying to kind of make it, what should I be focusing on right now? You should be focusing on where you are personally and where your household is. So doing that audit of your expenses, making sure you're not spending where you don't need to spend, making sure you don't have high interest credit cards that could eat away at your income if you don't pay them off. And then make sure you're saving some money because this could this downturn, whether it's a recession or not, could last six to 12 months. I have a feeling it's gonna be a little bit quicker uh, just by the nature of things because things are happening so quickly these days. That said, you wanna protect yourself, make sure your job's stable, make sure your family's finances are stable. That's kind of comforting that there's no like real economic magic that you need like just take care of your economic fundamentals and and that's kind of the best we can do. Caleb Silver an editor in chief of Investopedia. Always good to see you. Thanks Thank you. very much. Thank you. So with interest rates going up more Americans are renting these days but even that continues to get more expensive. Now the U.S. Treasury Department is stepping in to help. It will allow state local and tribal governments to increase their supplies of affordable housing with COVID-19 rescue funds. Many people need this help. But how do we get to this point? One major player in this housing crisis often goes unnoticed. Private equity firms, investors that buy and restructure companies to make them more profitable. And these firms are among the nation's biggest landlords. 
NBC's Zinclay Esamwa has more in tonight's feature report. Rent is on the rise in cities across the country. Tonight, skyrocketing rents, forcing a growing number of Americans to think twice about where home is. It's been making news for months. Rent is up. Rental prices increasing more than 30% in major cities across the U.S. There's a handful of reasons for the surge, but experts say one in particular is key, private equity firms. Private equity firms raise money from institutional and accredited investors, so not just from any ordinary person. Those funds are then invested in different types of assets with the aim of getting a return on investment. A lot of these private equity backed firms really moved into the apartment market, the multifamily market, in a big way after the last housing crisis. They also moved into the single family market. What they do is they go out and they find these buildings. They typically make some changes quickly to try to increase the profit. Vogel, a housing reporter with ProPublica, says private equity firms increase profit by raising rent and cutting other building expenses. You know, maintenance, security, all those sorts of important things that people really rely on to live in these buildings comfortably. Tenant advocates like Sofia Lopez say those money-saving measures for equity firms cost tenants. The tenants have told me stories about having to live without working heat in the dead of winter in some pretty cold places like Minneapolis. In one case, a tenant told me a story about water that was over an electrical outlet and needing the power to be turned off and the company telling her that she'd have to turn it off herself, which would have required her to wade through standing electrified water. Beyond safety concerns, there's the issue of affordability for renters and home buyers. The median home price in the U.S. hitting a high of $416,000 in June. With rising mortgage rates and expensive house costs, slowing home sales and pushing many to rent. Nationwide, the average rent for a one-bedroom, $1,701, while a two-bedroom is $2,048. That's a more than 25% increase since last year. As rents drastically increase, experts like Vogel say private equity firms are a main reason why. In February 2022, Vogel found that private equity firms play a major role in the rental market. Vogel reporting how mortgage finance companies like Freddie Mac are fueling the rise in housing costs. Since 2015, Freddie Mac gave billions to these firms, including real estate company Graystar. Most of us in the industry are getting very aggressive in driving expenses down. Here's Graystar CEO discussing his firm's ability to cut costs back in 2010. We can drive dramatic savings out of the expense side of the equation. But residents worry private equity firms' savings will come at a cost, pricing them out of previously affordable homes. A lot of the tenant advocates that we've talked to also feel that this financing that Freddie is providing is coming with very few strings attached for the businesses that are taking the money. Mortgage finance company Freddie Mac shared in a statement in part that they're, quote, focused on addressing the affordable rental housing crisis. More than 95 percent of the rental units we support through loan purchases are affordable to low, very low and middle income households, end quote. Private equity firm Graystar declined our request for comment. Today, according to Americans for Financial Reform, 1.6 million families rented from real estate owned by private equity firms. That includes over 1 million apartment units, over 275,000 home lots, and nearly 240,000 single-family rental homes. Private equity becoming one of the largest landlords in urban America. It's a change that hasn't gone unnoticed. After an extensive investigation into this practice, we have found that private equity companies have bought up hundreds of thousands of single family homes and placed them on the rental market. The House Committee on Financial Services surveying the nation's top five single family rental companies in June. Their findings? This predatory purchasing contributes to our nation's shortage of affordable housing and exacerbates the racial wealth gap. Now, advocates say to combat this national issue, local organizing and state level change is needed. Whether that's through rent stabilization or rent control, that could also include protections from fines and fees, 
a right to counsel if you go through an eviction or have some other kind of issue, knowing that you'll have a lawyer in your corner makes all the difference. There are organizations all across the country who do tenant organizing to make sure that the people actually living in these homes have safe, secure homes that are truly affordable to them, where they can live with dignity, where they can raise their children, where they can go to work, know that they can come home at night and rest easily. That was NBC's Zinclay Essamwa reporting, and thanks to producer Cynthia Silva and editor David Hall for that report. Still to come, a prisoner swap. The Biden administration has a plan to get Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan home from Russia. Who will it offer in return? We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. The U.S. has a plan to get WNBA star Brittany Griner and Marine Corps veteran Paul Whelan out of Russian custody. It might involve a prisoner swap. NBC chief foreign affairs correspondent Andrea Mitchell asked Secretary of State Antony Blinken about that today. When it comes to uh, our efforts to secure the return home of Paul Whelan and Brittany Griner, uh, you'll understand that uh, I can't and won't get into any of the details of what we proposed to the Russians um, over the course of uh, so many weeks now. Well, can you talk about why you would make such an important, why you would put what you call a substantial offer on the table? So here's what I can say uh, about this. First, as I mentioned, we've conveyed this um, on a number of occasions um, and directly to, uh, to Russian officials and my Hope would be that in speaking to Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, I can advance the efforts to uh, to bring them home. We have two imperatives when it comes to arbitrarily, wrongfully detained Americans anywhere in the world, including uh, in Russia, including the cases of Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan. Um, and I say this because more than unfortunately, horrifically, this is a practice, as you know, that many countries engage in. Uh, and one that we are resolutely um, working to, uh, to end, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But we have two objectives. Um, we, of course, want to see those who are wrongfully detained uh, be released and be able to return home. At the same time, uh, it's important that we work to reinforce the global norm against uh, these uh, arbitrary detentions, against what is truly a horrific practice. Russian state media claims that there have been no requests for talks. A senior U.S. official tells the U.S. that tells us that's not true, that the administration reached out and Russia responded. Sources tell us that the Biden administration is willing to give up this man, a Russian arms dealer named Victor Boot. They call him the merchant of death. He's serving a 25-year sentence in the U.S. Meanwhile, Brittany Griner testified in Moscow today. Russia detained her in February at the airport after finding cannabis oil cartridges in her luggage. Marijuana is illegal there, and she pled guilty to charges this month. Joining us now is NBC News national security and international affairs analyst Michael McFall. He is a former U.S. ambassador to Russia. Ambassador, good to see you again. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Tell us more about this guy, Victor Boot. What's his story? He is a very, very bad man. He is a criminal. Uh, he was an arms dealer, drug trafficker. Uh, many people have died as a result of his work around the world. Uh, we have reason to believe that he is close to Russian intelligence, uh, and that's why they have wanted to get his release. Remember, Mr. Putin, president of Russia, is also from uh, intelligence. He's from KGB. Uh, and so for many, many years, including even when I was ambassador several years ago during the Obama administration, uh, Russian officials, Mr. Lavrov, has tried to seek his uh, departure from our jails here in the United States. I said this last night on the show, and I, I wonder how you feel about it. I was always taught that an even swap is no swindle. Is this an even swap, Paul Whelan and Brittany Griner, for Victor Boot? No, it's not an even swap because he's a real criminal who did really bad things. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Paul Whelan is innocent and Brittany Griner is innocent. By the way, I would add Mark Fogel to that list. He also is sitting in a jail, 14 years in prison, uh, who I think has been wrongly charged for that crime. So in my view, uh, it's not an equal swap, but it is a good swap, uh, especially if you get all three out. Get the three innocent Americans out for the one criminal Russian, 
I think that's a good swap because you've got to weigh the pluses and minuses. Five more years of his detention here on his 25-year sentence, is that worth giving up to get out these three innocent Americans? And I think it's a good deal to do. It's not, a, it's not an equitable deal. I want to be clear about that. But I think it advances the interests of the United States to get these Americans home. There's been a lot of complaint from a number of Brittany Griner's and Paul Whelan supporters that the administration, in their view, the Biden administration, has not done enough quickly enough to try to secure Brittany Griner's release. And again, this is a plan. We are hearing through sources about Victor Boot. The administration has not confirmed that right. he would be the guy that they're, that they're exchanging. But what do you make of the efforts that the administration has put forth so far to try to resolve all of this? Well, first, Joshua, you made a very important uh, pumping of the brakes right there, right? We're all speculating about that Victor Boot is part of the trade. Nobody said that publicly, and most certainly the Russians haven't said it. So we should be careful until we know the full details. And we probably won't know the full details until the day it happens, right? And that's sometime in the future. Um, having said all that, I understand. I, I, I know I've watched, I've interacted with the, the various groups around those that are being held. All, and I want to keep saying three Americans, Mark Fogel as well, not just the two that have been mentioned today. And they're right to raise uh, these issues. They're right to put public pressure, in my view. And at the same time, I've interacted with the, the State Department and with Biden administration officials. I have no doubt that they have been trying quietly behind closed doors to do everything they can to get these people out of jail. Uh, and maybe today we got just a little bit of good news that that might be happening. What about the trial itself? You know, Brittany Griner has testified that this was inadvertent, that she was using cannabis for pain management, as many athletes do, as many people do, trying to kind of make a case for some leniency in this matter. How likely do you think it is that those entreaties will be taken seriously? I mean, how much latitude, how much leeway do you expect based on how Russia's court systems work? I'm not expecting much. Uh, I think it's the right strategy, by the way, uh, on her defense team. I think it was right to plead guilty to speed up the process uh, because she will have to be sentenced, in my view, before this swap can happen. But uh, in, in my view, you know, having dealt with the Victor Booth case for many, many years, I think they want to use this moment for a trade. The fact that they just did a trade a few months ago uh, for an American and a Russian leads me to believe that they want another trade. And, and so she probably will get a pretty outrageous sentence, uh, just like Mark Fogel did. Uh, 14 years, uh, by the way, is what he got. She'll probably get something of the same. And then that's when they'll try to do the deal. I also want to kind of level set about what this deal means and what we're talking about with Victor Boot. You kind of explained it in terms of how much prison time he's already served. We're not talking about something akin to Guantanamo Bay, right? This is someone who served charges. He was adjudicated guilty. He is serving a sentence, most of which he has served, and he would go back into, forgive me if I'm mischaracterizing this, he would go back into a governmental system that is already doing things that are adversarial to the U.S., right? So I'm, I'm, I don't know how much worse <laughs> releasing him would be compared to what Putin's administration, his regime, is already, is already doing. It may feel unfair, but in the net effect of everything that Russia represents to the U.S., including what's happening in Ukraine, maybe Victor Boot's kind of a drop in the bucket. It's an interesting way to frame it. Uh, I'm sure our Department of Justice doesn't agree with you. Uh, I'm sure the FBI doesn't agree with you because they don't want criminals to go free. And there's no doubt in my mind, uh, yes, formally, we're all going to pretend that he's going to go to a Russian jail. And the minute he gets to Russia, he's going to be celebrated as a hero. There's no, I'll bet you Putin will even give him some kind of medal. That all said, uh, the world is not black and white and, and just good and evil. Sometimes you do trades because you think you're better off doing the deal than not. And in this instance, in my opinion, if we get three innocent Americans out for one criminal Russian, I think that's a good trade. And I applaud uh, Secretary Blinken and the Biden administration for working to try to get to that end. 
I hear you. And I hear you in terms of the FBI, that there would be some very tightly gritted teeth if he was indeed yes. part of this swap. Ambassador Michael yes. McFall, thank you for helping us think this through. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Up next, beating the heat year after year. Governments are trying new ways to keep us cool and safe, including a new federal website. We'll show you when we come back. It feels like you walk outside and literally it is a sauna. And about time you get into your car, you are dripping. You have to open your doors for all the heat to get out your car before you actually get in. We knew that um, the heat was coming and we did plan for it. We've got plenty of water on hand. We double checked the shade in terms of the park area and where the shady spots are. We always carry extra water, um, not only in the stroller as we're walking around, but also in the car. I mean, you never know like when the car is going to overheat or something in traffic. So I just really have to plan ahead um, to make sure that we're safe. Lots of us have stories about these heat waves, maybe you too. But how do we make sense of it all, coast to coast? Well, check out this new federal website with a map of the U.S. heat forecast. You can see excessive heat warnings in the Pacific Northwest and Northern California, a mix of warnings and the less severe watches in Oklahoma, and the lowest level advisories in parts of the Mid-Atlantic and the Mid-South. Now, this map is on the homepage of the new website, heat.gov, the website launched yesterday. The stated mission of heat.gov is, quote, a nation free from heat-related illness and death. The U.S. government says extreme heat has been America's number one weather-related killer for the past 30 years. Meanwhile, you know how we give hurricanes names and categories to help people track and prepare for them? Well, now the city of Sevilla in Spain is naming heat waves. It's calling this current heat wave Zoe. Temperatures there reached 110 degrees Fahrenheit today. Sevilla says it is the first city ever to name heat waves. It will name them in reverse alphabetical order. Next are Iago, Zenia, Wenceslas, and Vega. But what difference will naming or mapping heat waves make? How much will that help save lives? And what else might help? Joining us now is Cascade Tucholsky, a postdoctoral research scientist at the Columbia Climate School. Dr. Tucholsky, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. First of all, before we talk about some of these new efforts, can I just get your sense of how well governments are doing now with the tools we have to help prepare people for heat waves and to help us survive them? You know, I think in the United States, um, the government, governments, both local, federal, and state, are doing better than we have in the past. I think after the heat dome last summer, extreme heat is really on the public's radar, and the Biden administration is responding um, in turn. What do you make of this new mechanism for naming and ranking heat waves? I know it's been kind of controversial in the past when, say, the Weather Channel named winter storms in a way that wasn't officially from the National Weather Service. What about naming and ranking heat waves? What do you make of that? You know, I, I think it's exciting. I, I don't have anything bad to say about naming heat waves um, in the sense that it raises public, public awareness about extreme heat, which again, in most parts, of, especially the Northern Hemisphere in the United States, wasn't really on people's radar in the way, say, hurricanes were. And the fact that we're just having this conversation is a good thing because the public is learning about extreme heat, which unfortunately is getting worse because of climate change. You were involved in a study recently about heat, specifically in urban areas. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so um, we built a longitudinal record of how extreme heat has changed for 13,000 cities on the planet, mapping both how population growth has led to increased exposure to heat, so more people in hot places being exposed, but also how cities are heating up. And cities are heating up through two mechanisms, climate change, and also the urban environment ourselves. Cars heat up cities. The built environment, sidewalks, buildings tend to heat up building or tend to heat up cities themselves, and that exacerbates extreme heat from climate change for most urban areas on the planet. And so what we really did is we tracked how extreme heat and population change are converging for every cities, and we showed, or for every city on the planet, and we showed 
that extreme heat exposure in cities has increased about 200% since the 1980s. 200% since the 80s, is that, to what do you attribute that mostly? Is that regular population growth? Is that urbanization? Is that climate change? What would you say is the biggest factor behind that? That's a really good question. Um, and so in our study alone, we can look at whether it's population growth leading to an increase in exposure or warming signal. And we're working on the research to really understand how much climate change contributed to um, extreme heat increases in urban areas worldwide. And it's important to note that one thing that was really unique about our study is we didn't look just at air temperatures or air temperature extremes. We, we looked at hot, humid heat, which at the most extreme can lead to fatalities um, and really has an outside impact on most uh, vulnerable populations worldwide. In terms of those most vulnerable populations, one of the things that the federal government mentioned with the rollout of heat.gov is that its overall new effort is gonna focus on some of the populations that tend to be most vulnerable to climate change and extreme heat, including black and brown communities, indigenous and tribal communities, and so on. Are those the types of groups that you find are at the greatest risk as extreme heat events get even more extreme? Or are there other populations who also need to pay close attention? Yeah, so not just my research, but others at Columbia Climate School have really zeroed in on those who are, tend to be most structurally marginalized in a community. And this is generally true worldwide, not just in the United States, face the greatest health and economic burden of extreme heat. Um, and, you know, thankfully, we have a lot of the tools that we uh, already need to adapt to extreme heat. And I think heat.gov heat is a wonderful example to use the power of the federal government of interagency efforts spearheaded by NINUS to allow local communities to use this data and use this information to target adaptations um, for their friends and neighbors. I should note, by the way, when you go to heat.gov, for those of you who want to go to the site, it's right on the homepage. There's a button on the homepage that is under current conditions and future outlooks, and you can just click current heat forecast, and it will show you the map that we showed you. Before I have to let you go, I know that there is an awful lot of pessimism about our ability to do anything significant about climate change, especially since we're already kind of like at or past some points of no return, especially in impoverished communities. I mean... It's hard enough to try to get them to build, a, to build a Whole Foods in the hood, let alone put energy efficient roofs on buildings. How hopeful are you that we're going to be able to wrap our arms around this problem and do what we need to do to respond to heat in ways that will save lives? You know, I, in graduate school, I was a pessimist and I've become an optimist. I really think that no matter what, the climate is changing, but we have the tools and the resources to, one, mitigate. So the first thing we have to do is reduce greenhouse, grass, greenhouse gases and then adapt. And we have the money and we have the tools. We just have to bring those resources to black and brown communities in the United States to make sure that extreme heat doesn't kill one American, doesn't damage one American's health outcomes or economic situation. And I'm confident that we can do it. Dr. Cascade Tucholsky of the Columbia Climate School, I appreciate your expertise and your optimism. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Last night, we showed you the flash flooding and historic rainfall in St. Louis. Those storms are moving east tonight. Floods are also causing problems in Illinois and Kentucky. Let's continue now with NBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman for more on what's happening around the country tonight. Hey, Michelle. Hey there, Joshua, and we're going to see that flood threat tomorrow. Also Friday into the weekend, we're looking at flooding rains and the risk for flash flooding. Part of the problem is we have this high heat humidity. So we're looking at heat alerts all across the country. Once again, tomorrow through the weekend, we're looking at uh, 38 million people impacted by a heat alert, whether it's a heat advisory, heat watch or heat warning. So it begins in the Pacific Northwest. We're looking at triple digits once again, some spots feeling close to 110. That's just the air temperature, no humidity involved there. We're looking at South Central States 
it's continuing with that heat day after day, week after week, uh, through parts of Oklahoma, Texas, into the lower Mississippi Valley. The Carolinas also seeing heat indices near 105 tomorrow. So the heat continues in the northwest. We're looking at temperatures 110 in Kennewick, 110 in Medford, 104 in Bend, Burns 102. And this heat will continue as we go throughout the weekend as well. Remember, many do not have air conditioning here. This is really tough. We're looking at triple digits in Baker City, right at the 100 degree mark on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Same story in Burns, also in Reno. And we're going to continue to bake in the south as well. We're looking at temperatures into the 90s and into the 100s. It's not just the air temperature here. It's where you add in that high humidity, that's where we're feeling like 108 in Houston. It'll feel like 100 degrees in New Orleans, even feeling like 103 in Charlotte tomorrow and feeling like 103 in Montgomery. Now we're going to get a little bit of a break. That's good news in Tulsa into the 80s by Friday. It's been so hot there, brutally hot. We're looking at temperatures really comfortable in Chicago, Detroit, Des Moines. So some spots feeling a little bit uh, fall-like as we head towards Friday. And then as we head in towards the weekend, we're going to keep it pretty comfortable in spots. So we get a little bit of a break before we start to bump temperatures up a bit. New York City, we're looking at temperatures into the mid 80s by Sunday, 86, 86 on Monday. Let's talk about the flood threat because we are watching the potential for some flooding still. We are watching radar all day long and we're seeing that training rain. So what's happening is we have a front that's sort of parked. It's nearly stationary across the Ohio Valley, the central Appalachians into parts of the mid-Atlantic. So we're seeing rounds of rain. It's almost like train cars on a track going over the same track over and over again. And we're also seeing severe storms. So you get that daytime heating that gives the oomph to these storms. So we are seeing some severe thunderstorms warnings. That's where you see that orange box in portions of Missouri, south of St. Louis. We were watching some storms roll through St. Louis earlier this morning, but we are dry at the moment. That's good news there. We do have a flood watch in effect for parts of West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, and we are concerned once again for the risk of flash flooding. That's where we get a heavy, heavy downpour. You know, the climate connection is that atmosphere holds a lot more moisture once it warms up. And then when we see this trigger of a front, it unleashes that. That's where you get that torrential downpour. That's that's why we saw nearly a foot of uh, rain in some parts of Missouri. So where you see the pink here, that's the likeliest spot tomorrow for some flash flooding in West Virginia, parts of Kentucky. We will be watching that very closely from Charleston, West Virginia, into Paducah. Also Joplin, notice St. Louis in the wrist there as well. So that will be a story as we go throughout our Thursday. Here's the setup. We kind of had two fronts working together. First, we have that stationary front. That's the a front that has two different colors. It's moving, but not moving very far. So that's why we're seeing the soaking rains. And then we're going to have a cold front that's going to swing through. That's going to bring some rain into the mid-Atlantic by Friday. Scattered storms enter the mid-Atlantic, and we're looking at heavy downpours, high rainfall rates. You know, everyone knows those summer-like storms where you just see those flooding rains. It comes fast. It comes furious, and it is a concern that we're going to be watching. The rainfall forecast through Friday, nearly three to five inches in some spots, but where you get those heavy downpours, we could see more. And we're even seeing the chance of some uh, severe weather as well. Now, notice as we go through the weekend, we don't get a break. So this is what stands out to me. We see soaking rains in the same spots on Friday, on Saturday, and then even on Sunday, we're looking at the chance of flooding rains in parts of the Ohio Valley once again. Back to you. All right. Thank you, Michelle. That's NBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman with your weekend outlook. We will get to some of today's other top stories in a moment, including more sentences for the officers charged in George Floyd's death preparations to ship millions of tons of grain out of Ukraine, and British courtrooms giving the public access that we Americans take for granted. Tonight's headlines begin in Ukraine. Its forces are advancing in areas that are currently under Russian control. Today, they attacked the Antonovsky Bridge in southern Ukraine. That's a critical supply route for Russian occupying forces there. Meanwhile, Ukrainian ports are preparing to restart grain shipments, this time under new supervision. A joint coordination center opened in Istanbul today. NBC's Josh Letterman has more from Kyiv. Hey, Josh. Joshua, the Ukrainians for weeks now have been emphasizing how critical it is that the U.S. continue to provide more long-range weapon systems to Ukraine, including those HIMAR multiple rocket launching systems. Today, the Ukrainians confirmed that their military used that system to attack the Antonovsky Bridge, the key crossing over the Dnipro River uh, to the Kherson region, one of the first cities to fall to Russia at the beginning uh, of this invasion. Now, you might 
might want to know why the Ukrainians attacked one of their own bridges. But that is because the Ukrainians have been talking about launching uh, a new offensive in the coming days to recapture that region from the Russians. And they want to deny the Russians the ability uh, to transport uh, their troops, their equipment, to resupply themselves, essentially cut off their ability to do the logistics they need uh, to support themselves there and make it possible for the Russians potentially uh, to surround them, cut them off, and force the Russians there to surrender, which would be a significant victory, both symbolically and strategically, for the Ukrainians as they try to show that they are not letting this conflict uh, harden into a status quo, that they are going to go on the counterattack and reclaim territory before the winter that Russia has now been holding uh, for months. We heard Ukrainian President Zelensky saying, of course, the Ukrainians plan to rebuild that bridge. It is critical for their own population, but that the priority right now is to not deny the Russians the ability to resupply their own forces. That news coming uh, as the Turks today announced that a new joint coordination center uh, is up and running to oversee that delicate UN-backed deal for Ukraine to resume exporting grain through the Black Sea. Now, that center is supposed to oversee the ships that would be leaving Ukraine, uh, heading into the Black Sea and on to other destinations, uh, including in North Africa, uh, with Turks intending to board those ships to make sure that nothing uh, that isn't supposed to be on those ships is on them, either when they're leaving Ukraine or when they are returning to Ukraine uh, to pick up more grain. Now, we don't know exactly uh, when the first ship will be able to go out. There has been so much uncertainty over whether that deal would hold together after Russia launched those two missiles at the Odessa port less than 24 hours after striking uh, that deal to let Ukraine resume exporting grain. But we do know that the Ukrainians say they are working right now on getting those ports up and running and ready to once again ship grain outside of Ukraine, potentially alleviating what many around the world fear could be a looming food shortage. Joshua? Thank you, Josh. That's NBC's Josh Letterman reporting tonight from Kiev. All four officers involved in the killing of George Floyd have now received prison time. The final two were sentenced today in federal court. J. Alexander King held Mr. Floyd down by his torso. He was sentenced to three years in prison. Former officer Tu Tao kept a group of bystanders at bay. His sentence, three and a half years. George Floyd's former girlfriend, Courtney Ross, called the sentences disappointing. She singled out Mr. Tao in particular. He has not made any attempt to feel anything that we're feeling, to reach out, even in the courtroom, to say something to the family. He was the most aggressive, taunting officer at the scene. He yelled at the onlookers that were trying to help Floyd. He dismissed any type of help from citizens that apparently in his speech today, he, he cares for, but he never showed that side of himself in the community. And there's plenty of people to back that up in Minneapolis. The sentencing happened in federal court, which does not allow cameras inside. That's why networks like us use sketch artists. Meanwhile, most courtrooms in the United Kingdom have banned broadcasting until now. From our partners at Sky News, crime correspondent Martin Brunt has that story. Wife killer Dr. Crippen in the dock of the old Bailey's court number one. This snatched photo led to a ban on cameras in all criminal courts until now. 112 years on, TV cameras will be allowed in to record just a small part, the very end of some high-profile cases. For the first time, viewers will see trial judges handing down sentences and explaining their decisions. The move is for transparency. In courts, there are only a few seats for the public. Many more will see justice being done. But they won't see the defendants, victims, witnesses or lawyers. Open justice is important and sentencing of serious criminal cases is something in which there is a legitimate public interest. And it's always seemed to me that this is a part of the criminal process which can be recorded and broadcast. The Old Bailey has had many sensational cases. 
serial killer the Yorkshire Ripper, the Cray gangster twins, Ruth Ellis, the last woman in Britain to be hanged. Until now, for the grim details, the public largely has had to rely on court reporters. I've probably trodden every part of this courtroom except one, and that's the bit we're not allowed to show you. I've never stood as a prisoner in the dock, but I know a man who has. Jonathan Aitken is a priest and prison chaplain. Before that, he was a cabinet minister, jailed for lying in a libel trial. I certainly felt very bad indeed when I was being sentenced, and I guess I'd have felt even worse if I'd known it was being televised. But on the other hand, why shouldn't it make it feel worse? I mean, the crime has been done, the guilt has been proved, the sentence is coming. That is justice being done openly and as visibly as possible, which I think is absolutely right. The court can certainly declare that the advice was unlawful. Some years ago, cameras were allowed first into the Supreme Court, then the Court of Appeal. Now, cameras in criminal courts after a campaign led by the main news broadcasters. This is a really significant moment for the uh, opening up our, of our courts in England and Wales. It's a further step towards the transparency of a really serious institution, the judicial system. In America, some criminal trials are broadcast in full and often in painful detail. <laughs> Is such TV coverage likely here one day? My own but fairly strong view um, is that what we see happening around the world um, illustrates why that can be quite damaging. For now, cameras here will be focused purely on the judge and the sentence. That was Sky's crime correspondent Martin Brunt reporting. What do gun makers have to say for themselves in light of America's mass shootings? We found out today. Lawmakers on Capitol Hill fired off some tough questions. You'll hear some of the responses before we go. How many more American children need to die before your company will stop selling assault weapons to civilians and young men? The man accused of the deadly mass shooting in Highland Park, Illinois, was indicted today on 117 felony counts. Bobby Cremo III now faces 21 counts of first-degree murder, 48 counts of attempted murder, and 48 counts of aggravated battery with a firearm. His arraignment is set for a week from today. Prosecutors say Cremo opened fire on parade goers at a 4th of July celebration. Statistics show that mass shootings are getting more common in the U.S. And today, members of Congress grilled the CEOs of major firearms manufacturers. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has more on that. Hey, Gabe. Over the past decade, as mass shootings have been on the rise, leading gun manufacturers have raked in more than $1 billion from the sale of AR-15-style rifles, according to a House Oversight Committee investigation out today. Gun manufacturers use dangerous marketing tactics to sell assault weapons to the public. Marty Daniel is the CEO of Daniel Defense, the company that makes the weapon the Uvalde shooter used. These acts are committed by murderers. The murderers are responsible. The committee says Daniel Defense's revenue from AR-15 style rifles tripled from $40 million in 2019 to more than $120 million in 2021. I believe that these murders are local problems that have to be solved locally. The earnings for another gunmaker, Ruger, also nearly tripled during that same period. That it is wrong to deprive citizens of their constitutional right to purchase the lawful firearm they desire because of the criminal acts of wicked people. Wow. Republicans on the committee calling today's hearing political theater. Never in my life have I had a gun get violent with me, but I have seen where people are use guns for the wrong reasons. At the hearing, Felix and Kimberly Rubio, their 10-year-old daughter Lexi, died in the Uvalde massacre. It's just horrible of what these weapons can do. They want the Daniel Defense CEO to be accountable. These individuals are using weapons that his company 
manufacturers. They're law-abiding citizens until he walked into that classroom and murdered our child and her classmates and two teachers. That was NBC's Gabe Gutierrez reporting. Hey, thank you for making time for us tonight. Tomorrow, we'll meet the director of The Captain, a new docuseries about Yankees Hall of Famer Derek Jeter. Share your questions and thoughts on the series on social media at NBC Now Tonight. Leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC, or email nowtonight at NBCNews.com. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. See you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.